Well, I came up into the kitchen for this little segment because I wanted to start off about breathing by just kind of giving a demonstration that I like to do. I do this in my physics class. I will often challenge my students to consider a trumpet versus a bubble. You know, given how loud a trumpet can play, can a bubble film over the bell possibly survive for any particular length of time? Uh, it's, it's deliberately a misleading question. Most of my students will say, oh yeah, the bubble will burst instantly. Very few of them catch on to the idea that the sound travels right through the bubble. The actual motion of the molecules, the displacement, is so tiny that you can barely see the vibration in the bubble. Well, let me show you what happens. I'm going to dip a bubble of my bell in here. And, as you can see, I get a pretty good bubble. Just blowing through the horn. stand. What you should notice is how long it took me to fill the bubble. Let me do this again. Okay, took quite a bit of blowing for me to pop that thing. Here's the point. We're often told, use a lot of air. It takes a ton of air to play a trumpet. The fact of the matter is, we kind of have to define what we mean by a lot of air. It took quite a bit of time for that bubble to pop, and for all practical purposes, the air itself is moving very, very slowly through the horn. I'm not using nearly as much. You can actually calculate how many liters of air are coming out of you. I'm not using a ton of air. Uh, I think it's better, saying, at least for me, the way I think about it is I'm not using a lot of air. I'm using my air wisely. Now, when I first started trying to study advanced trumpet playing, I was uh, kind of enamored by the notion that somehow just the use of the air was going to solve all of my problems. Yeah, I would agree that often for uh, some players it could be that they're not using their wind properly. But I think more often than not, for most players, it's a rather complex combination of air, chops, and the rest of your physique. Uh, one of the things that used to get to me was that when I would uh, work on playing or developing and expanding my range and things of that nature, I was often coached that no matter how long I was going to play a note or how loud, I would always have to start with a full tank of gas, completely filled up with air. So I was, you know, uh, take a deep breath from the bottom, filling up And I was supposed to do that for a note like that? No, it makes no sense. If I'm going to play a note, a, a soft, short note, I'll just take in a short breath. I'm not taking deep breaths to do that. Now, if I'm going to play a long note, taking a deep breath makes sense. because the aperture is vibrating a little more widely and that means your air is going to escape more quickly. One of the big things people talk about with the proper breathing is with respect to playing high notes. The thing about high notes that makes it interesting is you do need to take in a little more air but I think the reason is often a little confused. At least for me, the reason makes sense to think of it this way. When I play the upper register, if you look at my other clips, I have my upper lip slightly curled in over the bottom teeth and up. I'm making the vibrating aperture smaller. So the net effect is to produce more resistance to the airflow. So for a given volume, and by volume I mean loudness of the note, uh, I'm going to have to um, try to keep the air moving at about the same rate to get the same sort of volume I would get for a lower note. Air is a compressible fluid. It's not like brake fluid in a car, which is a liquid, uh, where if you squeeze on brake fluid, it, the pressure builds up instantly throughout the whole thing, and the, you can't change the density of the brake fluid. So uh, it's a great pressure transfer device. 
Air doesn't work so well because you can take air, which is a gas, and squeeze it. So if I take a deep breath of air and then try to blow a high note, what's going to happen is because the aperture is smaller, the back pressure is going to build up. So for me to keep the flow rate up, I need to push harder uh, from the abs. Okay? I just take a nice deep breath. Whenever I breathe, it's always from the bottom up, and I fill up on the top. I try to keep everything relaxed in here and in here. That's it. Nothing fancy. I try to keep keep it fairly open in here when I take my breath through my throat. I don't suck it in through a, a closed up throat. I try to keep everything very relaxed. Uh, in graduate school, one of the things they gave me it was a plastic breathing tube about this big around. Put it in your mouth over your tongue and it forces you to stay open and relaxed in here. Nice inhalation. Then when you go to exhale to play like a note for, from a classical point of view, right in the middle of the staff. relax breathing and I think that's it. When you're going to play a screamer note, what's going to happen is when you go to try to push the air through that, that smaller aperture is that it's going to fight you. So you need to have some more air pressure building up so that you can keep the flow right up to keep the volume loudness of the note where you want it to be. Take in a nice deep breath from the bottom up and they often talk about lifting the shoulders up a little bit too so you completely fill from top to bottom and then before you go to blow, you yank your gut in back right under the rib cage, and that's what they refer to as the wedge. You take everything and wedge it in under uh, your lungs to really compress the air, thus giving you a, a sudden burst of air pressure that will allow that will help you push the air through the closed-up aperture. So something like this. And so there was a tremendous amount of pressure. When I released it over my tongue, the air went whipping right through that smaller aperture and allowed me to produce the upper register note with a reasonable volume. The thing about the shoulder lift that my classical teachers bristled at is the notion that by lifting your shoulders, you're creating some tension back here. And I tend to agree with the idea that you need to be careful about that. You don't want to have any tension up in here. Because if you're like this, tense like that, so it's sort of tension that makes your throat constrict and make your voice sound funny. That is tending to cause the pressure constriction, if you will, to occur here rather than right behind your lips where it should.